it's lovely to have you with us. We've got 66 people joining and it's uh, shooting up. And this is a very special uh, free Think Productive webinar for World Kindness Day. So happy World Kindness Day. Um, we're going to be talking about the productivity of kindness and why I'm on a bit of a mission to spread kindness uh, more generally. I'll introduce uh, Christina in a moment. So uh, Chris is a friend and colleague. Uh, we've been working together quite a lot over this year and um, just has some, some incredible perspectives on kindness. So I just thought it'd be really good to double act this and uh, in introduce you all to Chris and Chris's work. So let's get started. So um, those of you who uh, don't know me, so I'm Graham Alcott, I'm the founder of Think Productive. Um, and we have for the last uh, decade or so been on this mission to help organizations to make space for what matters. Um, so that is all about um, helping people to get their inboxes to zero, uh, to really think about um, productivity in a very personal sense um, and to help them fix their meetings I'm probably best known for the book, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I also have two books coming out next year. So How to Fix Meetings with my colleague, Hayley Watts, and How to Have the Energy, which is all about nutrition and eating well to have the best energy for work. And also I have a, a podcast called Beyond Busy. So if you're not into uh, subscribing to my podcast yet, then uh, go to your podcast app and subscribe to Beyond Busy. Just had Anne Bowden, um, the CEO of Starling Bank, uh, on the podcast yesterday, which was great fun. Um, and one of the reasons I'm talking about kindness a lot um, today and more generally, not just for World Kindness Day, is that one of Think Productive's uh, values, we have five values in the company, and one of them is trust and kindness are our rocket fuel. So I'm talk, I'll be talking a little bit later about what that means and how we use that in practice. Uh, but let's um, start just by introducing Chris. Hey, so my name's Chris Kisley, and I have an organization called Kisley and Wild in the States. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I have been working with Graham. Actually, I've known him for about three years, and I've been working with him a lot through the pandemic, so I know a lot of people have gotten closer throughout this time, <laughs> and we're, we're no um, exception. Um, one, of the, one of the values at Kisley and Wild is to perpetuate kindness, and so... Um, and Graham and I didn't even actually know that about each other. Like we didn't know that the values of our two companies were in alignment. So when we found out it was kind of just a bonus, but our thing is all about treating um, people with honor, dignity, and respect, um, regardless of how you might feel in the moment. Cause I do a lot of leadership development work and a lot of teaching people how to engage, especially in the tough times. And then also practicing non-judgment and compassion because we can all use that a little bit in the world. Nice. Um, so um, if you are familiar with Productivity Ninja, you probably know that there are nine characteristics of the Productivity Ninja. And the ninth one, which kind of wraps everything together at the end, um, is the idea of human, not superhero. So when I wrote Productivity Ninja, the idea of this characteristic was um, we all have limits and you can, if you uh, incorporate all the right productivity habits and skills, you can seem like you're a superhero. So you can be the person at work who is turning up on time to the meetings with a really nice file with all the right stuff printed out and ready to go. You're responding really quickly to your emails. Uh, you seem to just be on top of uh, your game and on top of your work. Um, but you're not a superhero. There are no special powers. Um, so actually, a productivity ninja is just a human with good skills and doing the simple things consistently and well. It's really about recognizing that we all have limitations. Um, we can't push ourselves too hard or we'll face burnout. And we really need to therefore embrace the human side of how we work. And I think as time has gone on, um, human not superhero out of the nine characteristics is probably the one that, that resonates the most with people uh, You know, when we're in companies doing workshops and people go, oh yeah, I'm human not superhero. I need to think about that. So I think it's something where it's led me on to this whole conversation with different organizations about how can we be more human at work? Um, and the benefits of being more human at work, which I think many of us really recognize and also a lot of people feel quite scared of. There's some kind of uh, notion that you need to go to work and sort of put on a cloak or a veneer or a mask and 
you know, be acting in a different way um, that wouldn't necessarily ref reflect your personal values. So I've been thinking a lot recently about why that is, and um, I'm going to call this the ruthlessness fallacy. So we tend to adopt and perpetuate in our culture a whole series of very uh, bad archetypes around the idea of the business baddie. So when we think of leaders, when we think of entrepreneurship, we'll often think of figures like Steve Jobs or Donald Trump, and obviously in fiction, people like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. And when business is portrayed on TV, it's in shows like Shark Tank and Dragon's Den and The Apprentice, shows that are always you know, very dimly lit. There's kind of music that goes on in the background that makes it seem like everyone's conniving and evil and, and doing bad stuff. And I think what's uh, interesting to me is that this perpetuates in the culture where people feel, you know, even friends of mine will say to me, oh, you've been an entrepreneur for 12 years. You must have had to step over loads of people in order to be successful. And, you know, my, um, you know, all, my response back is always, well, no, like, why would you think that of me? You know, it like, just feels like a really weird um, assumption to make about anybody. But I think what's happening here is there's this fallacy where, and it's often referred to as survivorship bias, because Steve Jobs behaved in the way that he did and then was successful, we put two and two together and say he must have been successful because he behaved like that. And, you know, I would like to just um, flip this around and say probably he was successful in spite of behaving like that, right? People often say of Donald Trump, um, you know, he, well, he does bad stuff, but he gets things done. And it's almost like we have to tolerate this really toxic bad behavior um, in order to, um, so, you know, to sort of experience the, the successes um, that he has off the back of it. And I think this is just really wrong. Um, I think the reason that this perpetuates um, as a myth, this idea of the business baddie, is that there's a, a tiny part in all of us that is curious about what would it look like if we behaved in this really terrible way. And there's a curiosity about that. But these people, their stories are told over and over again, not because they are um, you know, good examples of leadership or even common examples of leadership, um, they're remarkable because they are the outliers. They're, they're the, not the norm. They're not how most people behave. And if you look around your own businesses, you probably see loads of examples of um, slightly more um, heroic, compassionate, empathetic leaders. Um, and I think we need to create more of a platform for the real heroes. Um, so Mary Portis, the retail guru, talks a lot about kindness, um, both in terms of kindness to her customers, kindness, is, kindness to her staff, Often in retail, you know, you're, you're working with people who are on casual contracts, they're low paid and using kindness as a way to really make people feel valued. Um, really, really important. Um, Nick Jenkins from Dragon's Den. So he was um, one of the dragons who only was on the program for, uh, I think, one or two series. And when I interviewed him for Beyond Busy, and you can go and check that in the, the previous Beyond Busy episodes, um, there's this really interesting conversation where I say to him, were you trying to be, it felt like strategically you were trying to be the nicest dragon or the kindest dragon. And he said, well, no, that's just how I've been successful all through the years. You know, he built Moonpig as a very successful business by being reasonable. So when he's on the show and he's giving people advice, even though he doesn't want to invest in them, then it's just not good television, right? Like people want to see the tension of someone being screwed over or, you know, uh, being, you know, seeing those really kind of ruthless, baddie, uh, behaviors play out. And the other ones on there, John Timpson, um, very famous, uh, you know, Timpson's um, shoes and key repair. Uh, strange kind of shop, I guess, Timpson's, isn't it, when you think about it? But his, um, one of his big policies in his business is to give second chances to ex-offenders and to give um, all the people who work in his business a lot of autonomy and trust in the way that he works with them. And that becomes something that when he shows loyalty to those people, it gets repaid tenfold. Um, and on the right hand side of the screen there, Tony Shah from Zappos and Oprah, um, you know, both people who are, you know, really thinking about kindness for um, the staff that they work with. Uh, Zappos is really legendary for its customer service and, and kindness. Um, and Oprah just bags of empathy. Um, so people who I think are just really at the forefront of doing business in a much better way and just re rejecting that whole business baddie narrative. Chris, do you want to add anything to, to that? No, nope, I think you covered it. OK, cool. <laughs> um, we can't really talk about uh, kindness and leadership without talking about Jacinda Ardern. Um, I think when we look at the last few months, there's been a lot of 
articles written about the the gender um responses to covid so you know how how typically a lot of the countries that have had female leaders um have dealt with covid in a much better way uh, than those with male leaders um it's interesting when i've talked about kindness uh kindness and leadership to friends and colleagues often some of the responses i get from women is they almost have like a a sort of negative reaction to the idea of kindness and leadership and one of the things that that that's uncovered is that there's this book called why nice girls don't get the corner office and essentially what this book talks about is how uh, women if they want to succeed in business and they want to get the corner office which is you know the sort of the the cornerstone of success you need to be more brutish you need to be more male and masculine and you know it's, it's a it's a masculine dog eat dog kind of world be more like that and i would say that right now if we look at what's happened with covid we need the opposite book to that we need the book that shows men how to uh, take on what are often seen as female traits. I think it's wrong to see them as female traits. They should just be seen as human traits, but traits of empathy, uh, kindness, listening. Um, you know, we need to have a book for men that teaches them how to be more like Jacinda. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that when we look at the future of work, when so many of uh, the jobs that people do now will be automated, I think what will come to the forefront will be human beings and you know human behavior managing and working with humans collaboration with other humans is going to become more and more the essential skill of business because a lot of the other stuff we can do with robots and machines right but actually how we uh, interact with each other collaborate with each other uh, for me becomes um, you know really critical uh, to our success so as i mentioned before um the, one of the, the values of Think Productive is trust and kindness are a rocket fuel. Um, and there's some, some thinking behind that. It's not just, um, you know, uh, kind of nice fluffy words. Um, I think genuinely by being kind to the people that we work with, we have a stronger, more robust business. Um, we have a more loyal staff team. Um, and ultimately it drives our productivity, creativity, problem solving, all of that stuff. Um, and the way that works is that um, when you're kind, what you do is you elicit and produce empathy in people. And by doing that, you uh, gain trust. And if you think about all of the different transactions that we do in work and life, right? So whether you're buying a product, whether you're deciding to work for somebody, whether you're collaborating on a, on a project with people, um, all of those transactions are based on trust. So the more trust you have, um, the easier it is to come to, uh, you know, negotiations, decisions, uh, deals on, on these different things. Um, you could do uh, a big deal with Donald Trump or Steve Jobs once, but you probably wouldn't want to go back and do it, do it a second time. So actually the leaders that are able to build that trust and, and produce win-win deals um, are the people that you're going to come back and work with time and time again. And ultimately in organizations, I think something that um, we really need to aspire to is the idea of psychological safety. So from a point of trust and psychological safety, it's much um, easier for people to uh, contribute, you know, perhaps uh, a really crazy way out their creative idea or say, actually, everybody else, everybody else in the room agrees on this thing, but I disagree and I've got a different point of view. And sometimes we need that critical thinking. We need that creativity um, and we need that honesty in the way that we work. Um, psychological safety is something that um, I think often gets talked about in uh, organizations, you know, in the HR department, but isn't necessarily um, as well known, uh, just like across the organizations. Um, Chris, have you got any um, thoughts on that? Like, why, why are we not talking more about psychological safety? Um, so it's interesting, we actually talk about it a lot in the US. So um, organizationally, um, a lot of the um, leaders in team development, like Patrick Lencioni, he actually does talk a lot about psychological safety and the Harvard Business Review does a, has done a lot of articles. Um, and especially in the last probably two years, we've been talking about it. But I actually think sometimes it's not very, it's not an accessible um, yeah. definition. So people are like, what? Yeah. Uh, you know, so you talk about it, it feels very academic. And so I'm glad that we're actually doing what you and I are doing because it's going to help people really understand it at a level where you can actually go make changes tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. And to get, you know, I, I kind of feel like we need to get it out of 
um, just the L and D team, right? And just and this becomes a thing that everybody is focused on in organisations. Um, we're going to talk about the seven traits of kind leaders, um, and then give you some practical stuff that you can do around this. So. Um, the first one is that a leader needs to have a clear vision and clear values. So clearly, if you're going to be a leader, you need to articulate the destination that you're going to take people um, along to. And then the second one is focus. And it's a focus on driving performance. It's a focus on results. And so it's competing and winning together. And the third one is People first, work second, always. Um, this has become a bit of a personal mantra of mine. I'm going to explain um, fully what it means um, in a couple of minutes' time. The fourth one is self-awareness. So it's understanding both your strengths and your weaknesses and being able to actually get out of the way and let people do their thing um, when you're not good at it. Um, trust builder, so helping to build psychological safety, building autonomy. Um, and encouraging healthy conflict. I think sometimes we, uh, we shy away from conflict. No one really likes conflict, um, but actually we can use those disagreements to actually build more trust. The sixth one is cultural architect. And this is all about making sure that you're rewarding and recognizing the things that you say are important in your organization. And so it's really remembering as a leader that the things that you put up on a pedestal um, metaphorically are the things that people look at and they'll want to um, do the same. Yeah. Um, and then finally, humility. So um, taking responsibility when things don't go well and then giving credit to the team when things do go well. Um, I think uh, ego is a really funny thing in, uh, in business in general, uh, but just being aware of, of that ego, I think, is um, just a huge responsibility that we have as leaders. So I think sometimes we sometimes we confuse the idea of kind with the idea of nice. Um, Chris, tell us what the difference is and, um, and how you see it. Yeah, I, it, this is actually a really great conversation because um, it really does get confused. So if you think about nice, nice is more um, not telling the truth in case it hurts someone's feelings. So it's a thing where you're like, oh, I didn't say that because I was afraid of what would happen. And kindness is thinking about making sure that you're telling the truth, but in a way that is for the person. And so um, that's when you actually have dealt with your own feelings before you go have a conversation with someone so that when it comes out, whatever comes out, that the truth is, um, be, it's able to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is like um, nodding your head in a meeting, but then going out and either talking in the parking lot or calling somebody and being like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And we actually call that the dirty yes. So it's saying yes when you actually meant no. Um, if you're kind about it, then you actually just respectfully disagree. And you disagree with not the person, but the idea. Um, and then the third one that we thought about was being too agreeable or malleable. So you're going along to get along. Um, Kind people actually stand for things, but value and respect other people in the process. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny how nice can often mean that you're just shying away from any conflict or disagreement, right? Which clearly when, you know, when we're in the business of, of trying to, you know, change things, uh, trying to come up with new ideas, like you need a little bit of disagreement, kind of healthy disagreement and um, healthy conflict in order to make a lot of that stuff work. Don't talk about radical honesty. Yeah. Um, so I think this is one of the really like really practical things um, that you can do is that if you want to actually have really good conversations where you're telling the truth, but being for someone, the first thing you have to do is look inward. And so you've actually really got to figure out like, okay, so how am I feeling about what's happening? And then why am I feeling this way? This is so that you can actually get out of your own way so that when you go have the conversation, you really are for the person that you're not caught up in your own drama. So it's everything from how am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? To also, what's the story I'm telling myself about why this person did what they did or why something happened? And um, as Brene Brown says, is that you want to actually have the most generous interpretation of someone else's behavior. And so making sure 
that you don't think, oh, this person like did this on purpose or, you know, they were trying to get something or this was their ego. You actually are like, you know what? I, I'm going to bet that this person didn't even know that, that this had the impact that it had. And so you go into that conversation, assuming no ill will whatsoever. Um, and you set it up for success before yeah. you go in. Brené is like Yoda, right? That thing about the generous interpretation of other people's behavior. I just think it's so, so powerful. Yeah, feels Mother Teresa-ish. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, let's talk about giving feedback with kindness. This is a, a little model that Chris is going to share with us. And we thought we'd title this one. That sucked, but I love you. Yeah, so when you, um, when somebody does something but and you need to actually give constructive feedback. So you need to share like, hey, you're off track. You wanna be really, really, so you do the first thing first, which is like check in with yourself, kind of how are you feeling about it? What's the story you're telling yourself? And then you get down to, all right, I'm gonna deliver really um, truthful, specific feedback, and then we're gonna have a discussion about it. And so the big thing here is to think about the fact that people typically have one intention and they often have a different impact. And so if you believe that even when someone has screwed something up or something hasn't gone well, if you go in believing like, okay, their impact didn't match their intention, but I bet their intention was good. So let me just say, okay, so in this situation, here was the behavior and here's the impact it had. And um, I like to give the impact on the person. So like whether it was, um, you know, your peers aren't exactly sure how to engage with you now, or, you know, something to that effect, you share the impact to self and the impact to others and then the impact to the business. And then what you say is like, I'm sure that that wasn't your intention, but it was your impact. So let's talk about how do we make sure your intention and your impact equal one another. And then you have a really good discussion about like, hey, tell me what you were trying to do. How do you feel about what happened? What do you think you can do differently next time? Yeah. And I think sometimes a lot of these kind of conversations, they can feel awkward. And so just having those really simple, you know, um, little bullets to hit and just a, a, a structure to guide you through um, some of those conversations, I think can be, be super helpful. Um, let's talk about perspective taking. Um, so I love this, this phrase that you gave me the other day, before someone will listen, they need to feel understood. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank Ironically. you. Ironically. <laughs> Hashtag 2020. <Yeah>. Um, <clears throat> so perspective taking is really all about, so let's say you get into a conversation and you realize that you're kind of rubbing and maybe you don't agree with what the person said or they're, um, and so I was like, okay, so pause, back up and think about the fact that really to have somebody listen to you, you really need to make them feel understood. And the way to do that is through something called perspective taking, which is where you are like, okay, tell me like what happened for you? How did you feel? How did you experience this thing? And what you're doing the whole time is saying like, all right, so you felt this way about this thing. And your perspective was this. And then you actually say like, thank you so much for sharing that. I would have not, I would have not seen it that way. Or I, I, that gave me some insight that I didn't have before. But what you do is you actually believe that their perspective and their experience is real and true for them. This isn't about like, you can't agree or disagree with someone's perspective because it's theirs. And so what this really is all about is making sure that somebody feels like you see them you hear them, you are working really hard to understand them because that level of like kindness and engagement and empathy really makes people feel like you care, which also makes them way more open to listening in whatever, yeah. whatever rub you're having. I also loved a thing that you said to me recently about this, which was that if you, if you understand the tool of perspective taking and you are skilled in being able to do that, then that means it's always your responsibility to play that role. Because in order to, to diffuse it, you need one person to, right? So if if, the, if this is something that you're familiar with and you've had training in or, or just uh, feel comfortable in, then 
it's your responsibility to uh, be the one to do that, which I think is, is just a really important thing as well. Um, productivity is about making space for what matters. That's a, a, a phrase that I uh, talk about a lot. And I think um, never more so than this year have we uh, been forced to confront a lot of the stuff that does um, really matter. Um, and I think this is really what I want to end on, which is um, I wrote actually a, a blog post about this recently um, under the same title, People First, Work Second Always. Apple's just going to share that, I think, in the chat. Um, and this has become a bit of a personal mantra of mine over the last few years. We actually had about three years ago a period where it just seemed like everybody on our team was going through really difficult stuff, you know, breakups, um, very sudden bereavements, really difficult stuff happening. Um, and for a while, we started to think that uh, our company and the people in our company were kind of cursed. And then after a while, we realized, no, this is life, right? Life is suffering, you know, to think about it in a, in a very Buddhist sense. Um, but people first, work second, always. Um, the definition of this really is that um, when somebody comes to you and they say, and, and they say, hey, there's something really big going on in my personal life. Um, I really don't know, don't know what to do. The answer is always drop your work, go and deal with what you're dealing with, take as long as you need, and then come back to us. And uh, the, the thing is that, is, that is always true, right? So the always has a double meaning. There are no exceptions to always, even when you're really busy, even when you're on a deadline. It's your job as a leader to replace that person on the team if they have to drop everything and, and go and do uh, something like that uh, and need to be away. And always is also about saying it's always somebody's always, right? So there'll always be someone on the team that either needs to be away or perhaps just needs some extra support and just recognizing that people always comes before task, I think is just a really uh, critical thing. Um, I kind of thought that this was something that I'd, I'd adopted as a mantra, uh, like in more recent years, the last sort of four, four or five years. And then I put it out on the blog the other week and um, the, my number two in my first uh, really big job reached out. I hadn't spoken to her for about five or six years. And she was like, do you remember when we worked in London and new people would start and you would always say, go and get your house sorted out you know, how long will that take? Just let us know. And then your start date is after that, even when we had really critical stuff going on. And I was like, oh, isn't it? It's nice to know, like reassuring to know that this is something that I've, um, you know, really uh, been thinking about and kind of using um, for a long time. Um, so as I say, I, I really feel like there's, um, I'm gonna open this up for questions in a moment. I think um, uh, I've definitely found over the years that when you uh, put people first and work second, you build incredible loyalty um, from your team. And that's not to say that work doesn't matter or you don't have high standards with your work. I, I really do. And I set the bar, um, you know, really high for my team as well. Um, but it's about recognizing that there's always stuff in our lives that, you know, um, that is, is, is either going to help us with our work or really impinge on our work. And we really need to recognize that it's humans doing that work. Um, so people first, work second, always. I'd love you to uh, check out that uh, blog post. But I think it really has a huge effect on productivity and ultimately it's just a power for good to be thinking about kindness. Um, there are cynics and there are people who will say, well, what's uh, what's the ROI of this? You know, how does this drive profit? Uh, you know, like surely we need to be more cutthroat. And I think in the, in the world, um, you know, we need to go out into the world and, and capitalism is about competition, right? So we need to go out and compete. Um, and there are times where our organizations need to be cut through, but then within ourselves and within our teams, we need to also be kind. And so that kind of marrying up of cutthroat and kind, I think for me, um, is a really important thing to, to recognize. And if people are asking you about what's the payoff for this and, you know, we don't have time for kindness and all that kind of stuff. And what's the ROI? Um, I'll leave you with a quote from Gary Vaynerchuk. What's the ROI of your mum? And that's it. So um, let's open it up for some questions. I know there's a few questions in the Q&A um, already. A um, couple uh, particularly for Chris as well, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, we're standing by to answer your questions. If you want to uh, type a question, you can type it just directly into the chat. Um, you can also type it into the Q&A. Uh, I've got three here already in the Q&A. Um, so let me uh, read out the first one. So Richard says, question for Chris. If someone gives you, as they describe, brutally honest feedback, which in my experience is often more brutal than honest, um, how should you respond, if at all? What do you think? So interestingly enough, I always tell people to say, say thank you. 
period. Um, and then uh, just like, thank you. I appreciate the feedback and then walk away and then process it with somebody else. Because um, sometimes people use that whole brutus, like, brutally honest uh, title as um, a reason to give you um, like judgy feedback. And so- well, it's, it's always, like license to not be tactful, isn't it often? Like, I'm, I just say it like it is. And it's like, well, no, you need- <laughs> you Well, need it's license to, really to be mean about, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like when, when I hear the word brutal, I'm like, uh, mm. like it, it, truth does not ever have to be brutal. It can always be like both truth and grace together. Yeah. It can be for you, right? And so, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There's like a lot in that. Sometimes people are trying to like try on a new skill or something like that. And so here's what I always do. I'm like, okay, thank you. And I go process it. Like I go call Graham and I'd be like, hey, I just got this feedback. It actually felt like crap to get it but I'm sure that there's a nugget in here. So help me mine for what actually I can take out of this. Um, but I don't, I don't engage when somebody says that typically, cause it often kind of is like, <sighs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, John Brady, uh, I put a question here. Presumably it's worth spelling out to your team that your perspective is that their intentions are positive. Yeah. I think probably if there's a, if there's a flaw in the people first, work second, always approach, um, the only flaw in it would be that if you had somebody whose intentions were not positive, then they could see that as license to be taking too much time away or uh, to be kind of, um, you know, uh, taking advantage of um, that trust and autonomy. Because I think ultimately it is about trust and, and autonomy. And I think those are the things that ultimately build, I think, a really successful culture. And I think if you um, have people who just are not bought into that culture and don't really chime with it, then they probably shouldn't really be there anyway, right? So that's about hiring and kind of recognizing um, that the people that you bring in, um, you know, share your values, uh, have some kind of connection to the mission. Um, and I think, you know, maybe that's uh, a slightly more difficult thing in larger businesses than smaller businesses. But then as we've talked before, you know, Moonpig, Timpsons, there are so many examples of organizations that are very hot on, you know, putting trust in people, giving autonomy to the right people and, and helping them to, to live out those values. But yeah, absolutely, you wanna be, um, you know, making it clear that like, we think your intentions are positive and we, you know, we think you believe in this at least nearly as much as, as, as I do or we do. I often think it's really good to actually do team norms and have assume positive intent be one of the team norms that you have. And then it actually level sets that expectation for everybody on the team. Yeah. Um, and then you can always go back to like, let's practice this. And so it's a really good, it just goes in line with the expectations for sure. Yeah. Um, question here, when putting people first and your business involves serving people, so like schools, training, nursing, et cetera, and an employee need conflicts directly with the needs of the clients, which people's needs come first? Is it still the team, the needs of the team always, or is it the children, the ill people, et cetera, et cetera? I think this is a really good question and it's kind of like a, a sort of ethical riddle, ethical dilemma in some ways. But what I would say is having spent the first few years of my career working in the charity sector, where a lot of people are uh, constantly, you know, uh, three days away from burnout and, you know, strung out from caring too much and doing too many hours. I think it's really important in those kind of roles to be much more respectful of people's personal boundaries and work-life balance, because, you know, particularly because they're people who are there because they care, um, often, you know, more motivated by that caring than necessarily the money. And so, you know, for me, those are probably the places to double down on people first, work second always. And, you know, and what that then involves is, um, you know, different conversations within the team about who's going to pitch in and cover for that person. Uh, it might involve bigger conversations around resourcing. And I know obviously in places like the NHS, that's just a really difficult um, circle to square. But I think we're talking about sustainability here, right? So unless unless we work out, um, you know, how to 
uh, manage people's work-life balance on a consistent basis, then people will leave. And that's certainly what happens in places like the NHS and teaching. Um, you know, people just burn out because they don't get the support that they need. So I would say those are the places when it's when you're when your industry is caring, you need to double down on caring for people. Anything to add, Chris? I was just going to say, it just reminds me of the whole put your oxygen mask on first yeah, before right. you put it on your child, yeah. like in an airplane. And so, yeah, I think that just underscores mm. it. Um, question here from Katie. Hi, Katie. Um, how do you help your team move from niceness to kindness? That's such a great question. question. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that I would definitely do is have the conversation about what is the difference between nice and kind and why do we want to move from nice to kind? Because it's really all about getting the best from people, having them be honest about what they're thinking, how they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what their perspectives are, um, and wanting to make sure that you as the leader understand how do I make this the safest place possible for people to lean in, especially as they're moving from nice to kind? Because there's a lot of fear about what if I say what I'm actually thinking? What if I stop nodding yes? Um, and so there are little things that you can do like in your meetings, institute, I mean, this is just a practical thing, but institute no dirty yes. So explain what a dirty yes is and, um, say like, hey, we want a clean yes. Like, don't say yes if you mean no. If there's something that you have a reservation about, get it out there so we can talk about it because we want you to have a clean yes going into this decision so that you can execute on it. And so, um, but the first place to start is have the conversation about what is nice, what is kind, and why would you make the move? And I think be honest about how people feel like what's at stake, right? So people actually, they feel like, uh, that's a vulnerable place to be. And so we wanna make sure that we set the team up with support to, that their vulnerability won't get shot down. Yeah. Um, I did a podcast a little while ago on Beyond Busy with um, David Barquet, who's the one of the Navy uh, captains. He wrote the book, Turning the Ship Around, if you've seen that TED talk, um, really brilliant TED talk. And he has this follow-up called follow-up book called Leadership is Language. And in the book, he talks about the phrases that we can use as leaders that are quite lazy and ultimately are not genuine questions, right? So um, things like, is everything okay? Are we all good? Does everyone understand? Like, there's no answer to that other than, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> even when you don't. So flipping that around and at the end of meetings, I heard a, a, an example the other week, um, Tesco has a, a sort of formula for meetings and one of the formulas in every Tesco meeting is at the end, um, people say what they're happy about in that in reaching that decision and also what their concerns still are, which I think is a really uh, useful way to make sure that there's always a vessel for that honesty and always a vessel for that, um, you know, very constructive uh, disagreement or um, just showing that there are different perspectives. And I think, you know, groupthink becomes a huge um, issue in organisations if we don't have some kind of level of honesty so yeah check out um, David Marquet's um, work um, he was on the Beyond Busy podcast but the book um, Leadership is Language I think is um, a really useful resource around that um, we've got a few more questions and I need to shoot in a minute because I am going to speak at Kindfest in a minute which you're very welcome to uh, join us for all afternoon um, there is a whole range of speakers including some of my heroes, it's, uh, you know, so Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, Frank Turner, Billy Bragg, um, and me. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but just before we finish, um, if you want more stuff from us, I'm going to be doing a couple of webinars around my new book with Colette Hennigan. It's called How to Have the Energy. So if you want to sign up for one of the free webinars on that, all about how to eat well to have the best energy um, for your work. And then Chris and I are going to be doing um, a thing that we're calling the kindness happening. Do you want to talk about the kindness happening, Chris? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to do a four week Zoom event starting in January um, to talk about the kindness in leadership and about how you do that. And so we've picked four like super relevant topics and we're going to 
talk to some leaders in the kindness space, as well as the two of us. We're gonna talk about things that are um, relevant so we can give you things to do like tomorrow afterwards. And we're gonna have you interact with each other, do some activities and do some Q and A as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, so yeah. it starts uh, the 14th of January. Yeah, and if you wanna get involved with that, if you just go to Eventbrite and just put in uh, kindness happening, uh, it will come up. We are the only event called Kindness Happening. Uh, Apple's just put the link in the chat here as well. Um, and if you use the code NINJA15, you get 15% off. There's also an op opportunity to buy one ticket for you and gift a ticket for somebody else, pay it forward. So if you're able to do that, and really encourage you to do that. And yeah, really looking forward to just delving into some of those uh, key topics around uh, courageous conversations and giving feedback and um, how to manage healthy healthy conflicts um, over the course of the kindness happening. So uh, come and get involved with that. We'd love to have you with us. Um, I mentioned earlier my People First, Work Second, Always um, blog post. That was one of the things that I put out every week as part of my Rev Up for the Week mailing list. If you want to be part of that, basically I drop uh, a little bit of positivity or productivity into your inbox every Sunday evening ready for the week ahead. And so if you're interested in that, just go to graymalcott.com and there's little forms at the end of every page. Apple has also just put that into the chat so you can uh, just click straight onto there. Um, and then I'll leave this um, kindness happening uh, slide up just, so, just as a reminder. So um, you know what it's called and you've got the code. So you have no excuse not to sign up. Um, and then we'll take some, some other questions. So Chris, can you see the, um, the Q&A on the, on the Zoom on the bottom of the screen? Yep, I sure can. That, yeah, cool. Um, so I'll just I'll read out one more, and then okay. uh, and then I'll probably have to go and uh, start getting ready for. Oh, um, Emily's saying when were the energy food webinars? Um, they're all on. If you go to uh, thinkproductive.co.uk, click on free webinars, you can see them all there. But let me just put those dates back up because um, I did do that slide very quickly. Um, so there you go. So how to have the energy. Um, and I'm I'm on the first two, and then the third one is just just Colette because I'm away. Uh, we'll just put the link to that in the chat as well. Cool. So a couple of questions then before we um, finish it up. So uh, it's probably worth saying now is 1:45. So um, what we usually do is just say at this point, thank you for coming and and being part of um, this webinar on the productivity of kindness. Um, this is like the formal end of the session and then what we always do with these things uh, as you may be aware already is we do the after dark section so we just carry on for another little while and just um uh, answer any other questions so um uh here's a good final question before i leave you chris and i'll leave you in, uh, and i'm gonna say leave, yep leave everybody in chris's capable hands um <laughs> I couldn't agree more with the people first work second always value, but any advice on how to manage directors, heads of, etc. Uh, against this value when pressure is being applied to perform against targets. So I guess that's saying like if people are kind of, uh, you know, kindness is all very well when things are quiet, but like we're under pressure and we've got targets to hit. So we, we don't have time for kindness, I guess. What do you think? Well, yeah, so it's, so that's one of the times where you, um, all your influence or all your relationship building is going to have paid off. And so that you get to have that conversation with somebody where, again, you're kind with them, where you just say, hey, do you have a minute to talk? And then you sit down with them and you just say, you know, um, this person has something going on, like it kind of depends on the situation, but you would say, I'm sure you didn't know this, but this person has this thing going on and um, I'd really like to talk about how do we support this person as, as they're trying to perform, but also trying to take care of what's happening, right? So um, it's, that's when you actually stand up for uh, the value in the organization and you pull somebody aside and say, hey, I'm sure that like you don't recognize that when you send emails at 2 a.m. on Saturday night and then you tell people you don't expect for them to answer them on Sunday, but you have to understand the pressure that they feel because of who you are. You're having those conversations um, and you just try and influence the best that you possibly can, right? You can't make decisions for people, but you can make them aware of things that they are not aware of. Mm. 
Yeah, that's yeah. always a thing where often if you've been in senior leadership roles for a long time, you just forget the impact. Yeah. Because it's been so long since you felt intimidated by a senior leader. Um, like Absolutely. people just people just forget the impact that that stuff has, right? Yeah. Re- yes. And they just have gotten they've they've been so they're so far away from the work of the day to day work that they don't even remember what it takes often to get something done or how much time it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave you to uh, read out the next question, Chris, and I'm going to head off and get into the backstage tent for Kindfest. So um, lovely to see you all here. Thanks, Chris, for uh, being part of this. And yeah, really looking forward to the kindness happening in January. So come and join us for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. All right, you guys. So I am looking for um, what's the next question out here? What's the next question that y'all have? Does anybody have one? 